Welcome to our final video having to do with lateral bracing for buildings. Again, we're talking about overall bracing of the building against horizontal forces such as wind and seismic effects. This particular video is focused on buildings with a geometry where the base of the building has been reduced as a gesture for freeing up ground plane. One of the problems we have in cities is that large buildings occupy their entire lot and produce very narrow canyon-like streets. And some people believe that we need to utilize the land in a way that gives more back to the ground plane and the urban environment. So we're going to discuss some of the experimental methods that people have used to go about that. This is primarily an urban design gesture. Uh, it may provide useful air rights. From a structural point of view, it's an unfavorable response to the moment diagram because we're putting the largest surface area and mass up high, and then we're creating a narrow base, which doesn't give us good resistance to overturning mo moments. We also have issues with shifting loads, um, which may increase uh, overturning moments and shear force at the base and may cause problems with uh, shifting live load. We are particularly concerned with using these in earthquake zones, although it turns out, for rather odd reasons, uh, some of our most common examples have been built in earthquake zones. It's generally not a good approach at all if you're trying to do a really super high-rise building, but if you're not going too tall, you can get away with playing some games with reducing the size of your ground plane. You can also simply open up the bottom of your building, in which case you're not really reducing your lever arm, you're just eliminating some of the interior material that you didn't need. So let's take an example. This is a building in Charlotte, North Carolina, which is taking all the tremendous loads that are coming down through these vertical elements and trying to create opening to make the base more accommodating of the ground plane and more inviting. The uh, slight problem with this design is that they've implied an arch as a structural form and that works fine for this arch and that arch and that one, but the end arch has no buttressing action to counter its tendency to spread outward. So in fact, even though this is expressed as if it was an arch, it's actually not an arch and this is the telltale sign. There is no buttressing at that arch. It simply just sort of disappears into thin air. So. Some people have said, well, if we're smart, we will shift all this down because we know these are acting more like corbelled uh, expansions of the column at the top rather than like real arches. So we end up with a structure like this where all those get shifted over. And here we have a widened out or sort of corbelled type column. And here we have another. And so we need to have lots of tension steel or something across the top of this to keep it from spreading apart. But this is a cantilever solution rather than an arch solution. It looks like an arch until you look at the corner and you realize a half an arch is not an arch at all. So there must be some other fundamental kind of behavior. But nonetheless, there's an attempt to accumulate forces into this column by basically funneling them down through this shape. Uh, if we don't want to do something like that, we can just put in a monster deep uh, transfer beam at the base of the building. In this case, there are only a handful of columns, or eight columns actually, that come all the way to the ground in this facade. All these other columns deliver their loads to either these cantilevers or this simple span between those two columns. If we we're going to put mechanical equipment or something like that on that second floor, uh, we can easily use this kind of opaque wall because we don't want, to, want people to see what's inside there anyway. Um, so what's happened here is we've pulled the columns away from the corner. 
and delivered all the loads to these two huge columns. But we still have a fairly good footprint at the base of that building, which provides some resistance to overturning moment and helps to stabilize it. Now we can carry that whole idea a step further, and it has been done in the Citicorp building or Citigroup building in New York. This is a very iconic 64-story building. Um, and what they did was they pulled all the corner columns away and cantilevered all the way back to a single column in the middle of each of the external faces of the building. They did this because of this church. They basically had a church there which was serving the local community and they couldn't find a good piece of land to send them off to. And uh, more and more that part of Manhattan was getting very densely built. So they had a kind of a political and economic problem associated with what to do with this parish. And the way they resolved that issue was first they build them another church but they also bought the air rights over the church and they basically cantilevered their building out. Or another way of looking at it is they notched their building back to make room for that church. Once they solved the technical problem for that, it dawned on them that there was an even bigger benefit than making a space for that church. And that was making a space, an urban space on the corner. So in other words, if they can cantilever out that way, they can easily cantilever this way. If they can notch that corner, then they can notch this corner. And what that did was it brought in a lot of light and a lot of life to that particular corner. So this is a view down into that corner, which is an urban space that this corporation basically gave to the city of New York. And it occurs in a really nice place, which is on the corner. So it makes the corner feel more like a public shared space and makes it feel less congested. So this is a view of that building when it was first built. So here's the new church with the notched out corner. And then there's the notched out corner to create this public space. And I want you to look at the size of buildings that typically existed there. This was roughly 40 years ago. And nowadays, if you go look at that kind of space, you see mainly high-rise buildings like this one and that one. Now, once they got started on this theme, they realized they could do something interesting with almost every corner. So they put in a shopping mall right here. And this is the interior view of that shopping mall. So basically, they took all their banking operations and just elevated them way up off the ground plane and meanwhile, they gave the ground plane back to this public space and the church and the shopping mall. So it was a very elegant uh, technical solution, but it also um, helped the city of New York quite a bit. But we have this interesting problem. We could put a huge, deep um, transfer beam down at the bottom to take all these loads from the upper floors. But when you go 64 stories high, that's generally not a very efficient way to do this. So William LeMessure, who was the engineer for this building, concocted this scheme of these outriggers, which reached out and supported all the columns. So it reaches up and supports that. And then there's a tension member that goes across here because otherwise the loads that come down would just bend that member down so we're basically creating this expanded support and then we have another expanded support here and so forth so every uh, eight floors or so we have one of these uh, tree-like structures all of which is channeling all the forces back to the center line of this building and these are some of the diagrams that William LeMessure did on a on a napkin or a in a restaurant where uh, he was discussing this design with the architect. And this is, shows the building during some of the framing operations. Here we have one of those major columns that's centered on the external face of the building. And here you see these compression struts. They're not very large in diameter because they're braced at every floor. 
um, but they are very uh, thick walled and the ones down near the bottom might even be rods in order to carry the kind of load that was involved. Now um, this structure still has a pretty wide footing because we basically measure from one of these outrigger columns to the other so uh, even though those columns aren't shown there's another one here and another one there and they give a base that's uh, essentially as wide as the footprint of the building as you stare down on the floor plan. Um, we can take all this a step further probably not on a 64 story building but on something like this which is more like 10 or 11 stories. I think this one is built in Portland and one has to be careful in Portland with seismic things. So this building is not very tall but basically those columns have been eliminated. There's only the core which is having to resist horizontal forces uh, that are creating shear but it has to resist all the forces on the structure above that are tending to topple this building over. So this core right here is a classic cantilevered beam which is resisting both shear and moment. When we go back to this building it turns out these outrigger columns are resisting moment and then there's a shear core back in there which I might be able to find a better picture of. Let me go back here. Yeah. So this is that shear core and then these are creating the resistance to the overturning moment. In this building in Portland when these columns disappear all that moment function has to be taken up by the core. In this case because they got rid of the columns they had to find an alternative and rather than put these compression struts such as LeMessure did on the Citigroup building they basically extended this core up above and then they suspended all the floors off of that. So this cable is supporting half of all of these floors and the rest of that load is going back to the core. Now you can't do this for very many floors because this is a very circuitous stress path. A load here has to get carried all the way back up there and all the way across there and then all the way down there. Circuitous stress paths allow lots of movement and flexure to occur and you really worry about that in a building like this which might get subjected to uh, oscillatory disturbances from a seismic event but also you don't want a whole lot of movement to occur because there's a lot of glass in the facade of this building uh, which can fracture when too much movement occurs. So this shows that building during the construction process with the huge cables at the top that are then supporting uh, the individual cables that are running vertically in the external wall. Now this is in Seattle. I think it's called the Rainier Building. Um, and it is one of the most bizarre buildings I've ever encountered. Um, doesn't look too bad here. It's sort of coming up out of the trees as if it was uh, some sort of eccentric plant life. Um, but when you look at it more closely it looks really weird. For example it's got all these little shops and everything that are built out around the base. So it's not like it's really freed up ground plane. Uh, the structure could have set down a, a wider footprint and accommodated all these shops internal to the building. But I think whoever did this just was in love with this basic idea of cinching in the base of this building to do something fairly eccentric. And I, I think uh, experiments like this are really cool and I always encourage people to have the guts to do something. Um, to be honest though in this case I don't think it came off particularly well. Uh, when you stand under this building you have this weird sensation of a gigantic mass being sort of balanced precariously and uh, you're staring at this little base and you're staring up at the, the huge mass up above and it's not it's a rather unsettling feeling and it's not um, compensated by any particular beauty. You don't look at it and think uh, that is really exquisite or I really see the urban logic to it. It's like it's for, it's pure spectacular structuralism uh, 
with very little else in, in the way of rewards. Now, sometimes we do get rewards. For example, this building was designed uh, as a self-shading uh, building, and it's a pretty cool idea. It's been done more than once. You have to be careful when you do this, though, because a lot of the things that you want to jam into that bottom floor, such as elevators and stairs and things like that, they're getting larger as the building goes down, um, but the footprint is getting smaller. But things like this can be worked out, and in this case there is a certain solar logic to this, and it feels pretty comfortable in this environment, which everyone understands to be really sunny and fairly harsh from a cooling point of view. Okay, now there are things we can do that don't necessarily make the base narrower, but free up uh, urban space. This is the um, Federal Reserve Bank building in Minneapolis, which has since been sold, so I don't know who owns it now. But it basically has two towers. Off of those towers is, is this uh, parabolic suspension element. Um, so there are no columns anywhere down below between this tower and that tower. It's about a 300 foot span and that opens up a really nice plaza at the base of the building. Spanning from one side of the building to, other, to the other are these trusses and they're about 70 feet long. So each floor plate is about 70 feet wide and then the distance between each of the towers is about 300 feet. So if you had a little more ceiling height, you could play football on one of these floors and never run into a column. This shows some of the detailing. This is that uh, tension member, which has some steel cables, and then it also has some uh, eye flange uh, tension members. The steel cables are to support the dead load. The eye beam is to add extra stiffness and bulk for shifting live loads. You'll notice all the verticals above are delivering their loads. So the trusses come, they load the verticals, the verticals then come and load this. The ones above are expressed as wide flanges, so they're column-like, they're in compression. The ones below are actually hanging off of this suspension element, and they're expressed as thin plates. And in fact, this shows a worker putting in one of those tension members, and it's one inch thick and eight inches wide. And the whole emphasis there was to make the absolute minimal obstruction to view out that window. This, by the way, shows one of those interior spaces with the trusses running from one side to the other. To sort of articulate the difference between what's above and what's below the suspension element, the glass has been recessed back at the top, and those columns have been encased in these black elements to sort of emphasize that they're, they're massive and heavy and working in compression. And then below the suspension element, we have those uh, vertical tension plates, which are one inch by eight inches. And the glass has been pulled out to the front and the mullions minimized to sort of express the difference of those two things. So looking at it from an angle, this is what you see. Um, there's a huge expanse of essentially a city block underneath that's uninterrupted. Uh, unfortunately, the people who built this bank realized at some point they didn't actually want a bunch of people circulating under their building. So they had offices up above and some pretty uh, sensitive and very secure uh, movement of money and other valuables down below ground. The idea was people were supposed to be able to walk through their block, but in the end, they put a plaza that sloped uphill, and you can't get off the other side unless you want to jump one story down. And as a consequence, there's a lot less traffic on this than the designers might have originally wanted. But it is a spectacular gesture towards lifting the building up and giving people some ground plane to occupy. And so I, I commend this as having more than it has more value than uh, simply being a spectacular exhibition of structural finesse. And by the way, one of the reasons this is a catenary and spans this distance as opposed to putting down a bunch of columns, 
is that the operations underground here were really irregular and there was no good way to put out columns on any kind of organized grid. Another example of that situation is the Broadgate Exchange House. This sits above a bunch of tracks that are coming into one of the main stations in London. Those tracks are curving and changing position underneath this building. It was difficult to find a way to put columns down that wouldn't um, be threatened by trains and wouldn't interfere with train traffic while they were being established. So basically this building was constructed to span across. And again, it's not quite 300 feet, but it's close to 300 feet from one side of this building to the other. This is a compressive arch in a parabolic shape. This building actually came after this one. And one of the reasons that they chose the arch is there's a long stress path. So a load right here has to go all the way up there and then back down again, or a load here has to go all the way up there and then back down again. And there's been some movement of the facade of this building, which I think I have heard caused some leakage. I don't, I don't have really good first in first hand information on that, but the long circuitous stress path is a concern. And that was an argument that Skidmore, Owings and Merrill used for using an arch instead of a suspension structure on this building was that even though that tension member is supposedly very efficient, uh, it also has excessive movement and the stress path is too long. So they basically said, well, this gets us back down to the ground faster. Uh, in this case, we have this arch, which is parabolic. And then there's a tension element across the bottom here. And this is the connection of that arch and the tension member. There are actually two tension members here. One of them is hidden behind in the structure um, and that was done to create redundancy uh, for security. So that concludes our discussion of uh, reducing the base of the building to free up ground plane and we've shown several different examples of how the structural problems that are created by doing that have been solved with some fairly innovative thinking.